And in case you should feel that this is something which only refers to developing countries, just in it, a point here about the uh, HS2 is a big high-speed rail which they're building in England. They've committed 30 million to road safety, most of it for bike paths, for bicycle lanes around Britain. And um, I was looking today for an equivalent um, American project, which I could put up here, and decided it simply wasn't something I knew enough about. But um, certainly stakeholder engagement in large infrastructure is a big issue in the United States as well. So infrastructure development is not about just avoiding harm, it's about maximizing benefits, but don't lose sight of the wider benefits. You know, it's very easy to feel that the benefits of that hydropower project I've just been talking to you about were in what we did locally. No, the benefits were in the 400 megawatts of power, which allowed people in India who didn't have access to power to be um, put onto the electricity grid. And, um, you know, some, I did some research many years ago looking at the impacts of indoor air pollution on poor people. And um, these were women who traditionally cooked over an open fire, but it was a fire that was lit inside their hut, inside their house. And they were um, at as at risk from lung disease as if they'd been smoking five packets of cigarettes a day. And the only reason that they didn't die of lung cancer was that they generally didn't live long enough to get lung cancer. They died of something else before they had the opportunity. So um, the provision of electricity to stop people having to do something like cook over an open fire in their house is a really big infrastructure benefit. And we shouldn't lose sight of those kinds of benefits. Uh, so now I want to just to talk a little bit about the development context of doing infrastructure projects. And this is really looking at the kind of projects which I've tended to finance, which are in developing countries. Um, and the point here is that the pink box on the right is about the project. Everything else on this slide is about the context of the project. So it's about looking at the government's poverty reduction strategies, its energy sector plan, its water resource strategy, it's the riparians and international treaties that it has on the sharing of rivers national and international agreements, what um, climate obligations does the country have, what transparency obligations. And when I was working at the World Bank, we would spend many months looking at these issues, really before we were allowed to consider what project concerns there might be associated with a particular project. And it had to be in line with all these other development context issues before we were allowed to look at the actual project itself. Uh, the World Bank has its own environmental and social framework, as do many multilateral development banks, but I'm showing you this one because it's the one I'm familiar with. Um, in this case, they have 10 safeguards which every project has to comply with. And that includes things like safe working conditions, obviously the environmental impacts of a project. Uh, it looks at things like community health and safety. Um, one of the biggest issues we found around um, hydropower projects in remote areas was actually road safety. And um, this wasn't the first thing that occurred to me but um, one of the biggest safety issues for the local people was the fact that they weren't used to heavy traffic on the roads. And as a result, they didn't, you know, all that stuff we were taught as children in terms of crossing roads, they'd just never known. 
they never bothered about worrying about traffic when they crossed the roads because there was so little of it. Now they were living right next to a big construction site and very likely to get run down on the road. So um, there are a lot of different things to think about. Cultural heritage, the importance of protecting any cultural heritage sites, any burial sites, which are close to an infrastructure project. In one of my projects, there was a local belief that there was a, a god who lived in the river. And the biggest concern of the local stakeholders was that the river god would be offended by the project. And so all of these things are really important to the people concerned. Oops, sorry, that should have a title, never mind. Uh, this slide is about the importance of consultation. And uh, it's quite difficult for you to see exactly what this is, but the line through the middle is a road. And this was about the design of a new road. And um, it was a highway in Gujarat and um, they sat down with the local people to consult on the design of this road. And there were several things which the local people were able to tell them. So this, where there's a number two, was an area that got waterlogged. And so the engineers put extra drains in that area. There was a concern that the primary school meant there was a frequent crossing place and so um, a bit further up, they introduced a bridge over the road to allow people safe crossing. There's a shrine just in that area that's got the dotted line around it, um, which they were very concerned should not be impacted. And so um, uh, measures were put in place to protect the shrine. So uh, just an example of the sort of good design you can do when you talk to people about what's important to them. Uh, consultation, too early or too late? Um, consultation is so important, so important in so many ways. But um, if you go and talk to people before it's decided that you're going to do a project, you say you're one of five sites where we might do a project, all they want to know <coughs> is whether it's their project that's going to get selected. And some of them may be for it, some of them against it, but they don't really care about the other four sites at all. If you consult too late, when the project is already fully designed, then um, they, there's no opportunity to do, as I said on this slide, which is to engage about design and ensure that um, local knowledge is incorporated into so um, it's really important to try to consult um, probably at several times, but at different stages of the project and with different, um, different priorities and um, intentions at different stages. The difficulty is to combine um, stakeholder engagement, which is all about emotion, values, preferences and perceptions with the really hard science of infrastructure development, which is about engineering, it's about technical risk, it's about economics and pricing. And um, probably I felt my biggest job was in trying to bring together those two fields. Um, there's a wonderful set of cartoons which come from a thing called the Water and Sanitation Partnership, and this is one of them. It says, I'm pleased to donate these computers to every school in the region. And the little child is saying, who's going to donate the electricity to make them work? Um, a lot of infrastructure is about joined up development. It's about making sure that you don't just land in a helicopter and try and give somebody something without it being really well planned and developed. Um, and just, I often get asked at the end of this kind of presentation, why developing country projects are different, why they might need different planning um, considerations than uh, 
a developed country project. And um, I think it's a lot of it is about poverty. It's about development imperatives. Um, what I see is that some developing country communities don't care about their environment in the way in which you might expect them to, because they're too busy worrying about um, poverty and health and education and where the next meal is coming from. They may not, as a result, be able to worry about um, you know, a species which might get made, um, or might be removed from the area by a project. So it's really important to help people to worry about the things not only that they're worrying about now, but the things that they will be worrying about in 20 years time when they've actually built up the capacity to worry about it. Uh, one of the questions I ask and would really like to talk to you about is where the line is between an infrastructure project which produces development benefits and corporate social responsibility. So if a company develops a project and consequently pays for a local school, is that a development benefit or is it part of their corporate social responsibility? And uh, there's no good answer to that, but it's an interesting question. I'm going to stop there because I really want to hear your questions and to talk to you. So um, this is just my my attempt at moving towards sustainable development and my emails on the bottom of this slide if anybody needs it. So uh, yes, questions, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Plummer Beckman. That was lovely. Um, let's start here first to see um, if anybody in class have any questions. Yes, Joe. So I have a, a question from Joey. Okay. Hello, thank you for speaking. Hi there. Um, I'm part of Engineers Without Borders, and we have mm -hmm. a project in Nicaragua that's uh, basically drilling a well. And we've really struggled with connecting with the community um, because of the pandemic. We can't travel, obviously. Have you yeah. done any projects um, during the pandemic where you've had to work with people virtually in different countries? Uh, do you know, I haven't, but I did actually do a project years ago where um, the security situation locally was such that we weren't allowed to travel there despite the fact that we had an ongoing project, the security situation sort of deteriorated while we were building it. And um, we actually managed to team up with a local NGO, a local association, and um, kind of work through them because the local people didn't tend to have very much connectivity. So it was difficult to talk to them, but um, the NGO could um, talk to us and then talk to them and kind of act as a go between between but that I'm afraid is the only experience I've had of that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? By the way, I like the cartoon so much. It's sort of like, um, don't give me fish, teach me fishing. And yeah. I think that that's what we we need, but you know, in, in developing and developed countries, it's it's yes. how do we get the projects maintained and sustainable sustainable for years to go? It's not just about building them; it's about maintaining yes. them for long enough. Absolutely, and it it amuses me because when I very first started, which obviously was some years ago, um, sustainability used to mean. Um, the ability of a project to sustain over a very long period of time. You know, will it still be there in 50 or 100 years was the first question. Mm -hmm. And it, um, the sustainability term has grown from that. But I think we still need to remember sometimes that that's at the bottom of what sustainability means. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I actually have a request if 
Lisa, if you don't mind. So you talked about the corporate social responsibility. Can you talk more about it? It's, it's not a term that we, um, we've gone through in class okay. so far. So I just want the students to, to familiarize okay. themselves with, with this term better. And this is something which we spend a lot of time worrying about at the Institute for Sustainability Leadership here in the University of Cambridge which is um, what a company's um, responsibility is to something other than profit. And um, there are uh, reports which companies now routinely produce, which will set out what they've done, which they feel has um, improved the world as well as improving their bottom line. And um, they put these in a report, which is usually called a corporate social responsibility report. And it will say what, um, maybe what charities they've supported, what local projects they've been involved in, or what their staff have been involved in. And some companies will do things like say to a member of staff, if you raise $50 for a charity, will match it with another $50. And so those sorts of things. For big companies, these can be really quite substantial um, documents. But um, the latest kind of thing is um, to, to merge that into a company's annual report. So rather than having two separate reports, their annual report, which is their financial numbers and their corporate social responsibility report. We have a new term which is integrated reporting, which says that you should put the two together. So uh, that's kind of what we're working on at the moment is uh, how you do integrated reporting. So yeah. Interesting. Any questions about this guys? Any questions from the audience? Also, something related is the um, engagement, and you talked about the um, uh, consultation. So this is this is tied to stakeholder analysis, right? And yeah. you're talking to different stakeholders. So uh, in reality, we go over this in class, but in reality, what are the challenges with this, with the you know conducting stakeholder analysis and the consultation? Okay, well, I, th I think one of the first big challenges is working out who the stakeholders are. And that mouse may sound incredibly obvious, but um, there are people who would like to be stakeholders um, who actually aren't affected by the project. So you might get somebody who's maybe, you know, the, the rich landowner who lives um, 30 miles away um, thinks they're really important and should be included. And then you have um, the, the guy who lives rough and sleeps in the village, which is going to be affected by the project. And you think that he's a stakeholder, but the village says, oh no, you know, he's not entitled to be consulted because he doesn't own land or he doesn't own a house. He just sleeps rough in the village. And so um, it, making sure that you include everyone and don't give one person a lot more voice than the others just because they have a lot more money can be difficult. Uh, the other thing that can be difficult in some societies is to make sure that you hear the voice of every part of society. And um, my favorite story about this is doing a project in Malawi where um, the men were very much in charge and the women really wouldn't say much while the men were in the room. They didn't feel empowered to say much. And um, so I was involved in a project to install standpipes, water um, taps in the middle of the village. And um, I couldn't get to talk to the women. So in the end, I sent the men out on a really important field visit with the engineers. And I told them all to go out and decide where the water pipes were going to be, because this was really, really important. And this meant that I could spend the morning in the village with the women 
and we sat and had many, many cups of tea. And we talked about children and everything you can think of until they were finally feeling brave enough to talk to me about the water pipes and to admit that they didn't want them. And I said, why, why do you not want clean water? And they said, because we're not stupid. We know to boil the water before we give it to our children. But the only time we get to leave the village or to talk to each other, or even to leave our house, is when we walk to the river to wash our clothes. And if you put a standpipe, we'll never be allowed to leave our houses again. And it was, it was an absolute revelation for me to be able to talk to people and to get a real view like that of how they felt. Who would have thought that this was uh, yeah. even an excuse out there? <laughs> yes. We always think about clean water, but we never thought about it from a journey point of view. <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. To get water. Yes. That, that particular village was only about a kilometer from the river. And they said, we don't mind walking the kilometer. It's good. We chat while we're walking. And it's just, you know, we just hadn't looked at it from their point of view at all. Was... But, but this, this is an excellent example of why you need to talk to your stakeholders. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So much so. Yes, absolutely. And interestingly, I, I went further and said to them, so what do you want? What, what if we, you know, if we could, what infrastructure would you want? And they said, we want electricity. And I said, why do you want electricity? And they said, so that after dark, our children can study and get a better education and not have to live the way we lived. Which, uh, honestly, it was a humbling experience, yeah. spending time with them. Yeah. Well, lovely. Thanks for sharing, Dr. Plummer. So um, another thing before we wrap up. So going yeah. back to the question, um, do you think that sustainability um, limits development or is it sustainable? It, it enhances development. Personally, what do you think? I, I think that it's important to be aware of the fact that it can limit development. And, but I think if you're aware of that, then you can make it work. Um, but I think that sometimes there are people who are too dogmatic in saying, oh, we can't do this because, you know, that will, will increase carbon emissions or we can't do that because, and so long as you're aware of that and conscious of it, then it's possible to make sure that you do development, which is sustainable. But it's just making sure you look at it from the point of view of the people it's trying to help, not the point of view of some um, person who's producing a table of numbers while sitting in London. Makes sense. It's a perfect way to end this talk. <laughs> well, um, again, thank you very much. This was fascinating, all the, the examples that you've shared with us. Uh, thank you very much. Please uh, give Dr. Plummer back a round of applause. <laughs> thank like you very more much. About thank your, you. your experience. I, I know that there's plenty of, of uh, stuff in there. So hopefully <laughs> next time that will be in person after yes. it is all said and done. Absolutely. That would be brilliant. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for everybody okay. on via Zoom. This will be recorded. So if you if you want the recording, um, please send me an email and be happy to share this with you. All right. So thank you thank so you much. Very much. Okay. Bye for now. Thanks. Thanks, Judas. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay.